wow, I am really rusty at this. This is like the 27th and a half take that uh, I've done of this simple little intro here. But best albums, 2017, Indian Alternative. Let's do it. Um, yeah, I have fun recording stuff on YouTube, but definitely my favorite occasion last year was doing the best albums of 2000, 2016. So I'm all pumped up for this. And uh, yeah, this will probably be the only YouTube video I do in 2017. A lot of stuff going on. Um, I got married this year, which is a very wonderful experience. If you have a particular somebody you've been with for a while in mind that you're thinking about popping the question to, I would highly encourage it. Um, it really enriches your life all around. And then me and Daniel and John of Rail City have been working on some new recorded material. So watch out for that soon. Um, our first batch of stuff, I really didn't have any idea what the hell I was doing. Um, I read a bunch of books and, and watched a bunch of, a bunch of YouTube videos. Um, and at this point, I feel like I have a pretty solid foundation for how to record and, and mix things um, and song arrangements and stuff like that. So I think the next batch of songs are going to be really, really sleek and sexy. These are songs that we played while playing shows around in 2016. So all the songs are very matured and I think in their ripest and, and <clears throat> most final form. So uh, yeah, get excited about that in 2018. But uh, let's take a look at some cool stuff that happened in 2017. Um, last year's video, I was really excited about the stuff that came out in 2016. There was one specific stretch in August 2016 where it was like four mind-boggling albums every single week, and it actually made it really hard to, to narrow it down to a list. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that was like 16 crazy albums within one month in 2016. 2017, I felt like a lot of the music that I was excited about um, a lot of people, re it seemed to me like they released stuff just because they hadn't released anything in a long time and, and maybe their money was running a little bit low. So a lot of releases this year felt a little bit underdeveloped to me. Um, a lot of the bigger releases I thought were really overproduced, had too much sheen and a lot of bands that are getting pushed nowadays, uh, I found them way, way too trendy like, yeah, what makes them them, what's at the core of everything they do is something ephemeral that nobody's going to care about in, in six or nine months or however long. And they're just being propped up by marketers. And the albums that I did like this year were all kind of had kind of a sad undertone. Uh, so, yeah, not a lot of jovial albums on this list, all kind of dreary, but uh, a lot of very mystical albums. Certainly a lot of very moving albums, and I look forward to going through them with you. Uh, I'll preface this the same way I prefaced the list in 2016. This list is not without personal bias. Um, most of the bands on this list are bands that I've liked for a long time. But, you know, I'd say three or four of them are bands that I either got turned off to at some point, or I was just never, you know, never waded into their waters to begin with. But um, I tried to keep an open mind this year. And yeah, there were a couple real surprises this year, pretty outside, pretty far outside my comfort zone that um, were undeniably good when I was listening to them. So we are going to, uh, to cover that. And then let's see, what else did I want to cover? Oh yeah, the artists on this list are limited to people who had their music up on Tidal. That's what I use for my music streaming stuff. And, you know, if you use Amazon or, or Apple or or whatever for your music streaming, it's probably going to have this exact same stuff up there. But, um, you know, this whole list isn't to belittle the efforts of people such as myself who put their music independently up on SoundCloud and YouTube. Um, I routinely find really, really crazy shit, um, especially like lo-fi electronic stuff on SoundCloud. And then, you know, a week later, I can never find it again. And it's this big mysterious thing that I guess I'll only hear in my dreams for the rest of my life. But uh, yeah, so this is just people who had some sort of uh, clout behind their music that, that got them put up on streaming sites. Let's do it. Coming in at number 10 on the best Indian alternative albums of 2017 is an electronic artist who veered into classical music territory this year. 
Emika. I think it's pronounced Melanphony. Uh, you're probably asking yourself, why is an electronic ar artist playing with an orchestra on the best indie albums of 2017? I'm going to show you why. I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but uh, this was released by Emika Records. Uh, copyright Emma Jolly, 2017, published by Emika Records. Uh, yeah, this is entirely self-funded, self-released, and because of that, totally badass and 100% indie from the get-go. Go, Emika. For those of you not yet familiar with Emika's music, uh, she was an intern, if I'm not mistaken, at the Ninja Tune record label in the UK. Uh, she was brought on in a marketing capacity, but I think she was a sound designer and a classical musician by trade. And... Um, they actually, Ninja Tune actually ended up releasing her debut album in 2011, I think it was. Uh, uh, 2011 and thereabouts was the heyday of dubstep, and Emma certainly capitalized on that trend. But while a lot of dubstep was very uh, LFO-centric, a lot of whoop, whoop, whoop stuff, Emma focused on really deep sub bass, uh, really heavy beats with a lot of space in between them. And the empty spaces in her music and the eeriness that that created were as essential to her formula as the um, beats and stuff like that. Uh, the stuff that was actually taking up space in her tracks and, and made her tracks what they were. Um, she's also a very accomplished vocalist, um, very sexy vocalist. And as you can see, a very physically attractive person all around, which certainly doesn't help doesn't hurt the marketability of her uh, her music. Uh, I would say her debut album was really the high point of her music career. She certainly has a solid fan base, one of which I certainly am. But um, I think Ninja Tune put out her second label, and then she was on uh, smaller labels after that. I think this is her first self-released album. Um, very well done all around. But uh, she was also on the first track from the weekend's Kissland album. Um, I'm sure that some of her fans found out about her through that. And that was probably her her best shot of hitting it big was when the weekend pulled a really, really big sample of her song Professional Loving and put it in uh in one of his tracks. So yeah, Emika made her stock and trade dubstep, but this is not a dubstep album. This is a classical music album with a fucking symphony. Check it out, Prague Metropolitan Orchestra. So how did that happen? Well, I think it all goes back to Emma's roots as an artist. And, you know, sometimes artists will take mid-career leaps of faith into totally different genres than what they've worked in historically. And um, I think there's usually two ways that that can go. The first way is when an artist uh, has kind of laced their music with a certain genre. A lot of times accidentally and, you know, only on their fourth or fifth album, they've realized that they've really been flirting with this type of music and they go on kind of a tangent to fully embrace this thing that's kind of been hinted at in their music. I would say a good example of that is actually Danzig. Um, a lot of Danzig's uh, operatic vocals and progressive arrangements of his music um, I think led him to make an opera album called Black Aria, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's really, really not regarded well by critics. I thought it was entertaining enough, but certainly not of the same caliber of the of the rest of Danzig's stuff. But um, yeah, so that's one type of situation where an artist jumps into uncharted territory um, and it usually doesn't end well. I would say the more successful formula for jumping into uncharted territory as an artist, and this is exactly what Emika does on this album, is when they have some sort of background, usually in their formative years with a certain type of music, and mid-career, they totally re revert back to the type of music they started out as and utilize what they learned in their journey as an artist to, um, to approach uh, what they started out doing in music. Uh, I would say a really good example of this is Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead. Uh, Johnny Greenwood, their lead guitarist, started out as a viola player. And, um, you know, he obviously was very successful and wrote some of the most famous guitar riffs in history in Radiohead. 
uh, some of the most famous songs too. He uh, wrote the last song on OK Computer. But now John, nowadays, Johnny Greenwood is more well known as a film composer and is generally very, very uh, well regarded for the um, musical backdrops that he, he gives to, to cinema. So yeah, Emika basically has the exact same background as Johnny Greenwood. And just like Johnny, she totally reverts back to classical music on this very ambitious symphonic composition this year. Um, I'm not a big fan of classical music, even though I did take a classical music course in college, so I do have a fair amount of knowledge about classical music history. Um, it was, you know, fascinating enough that it stuck with me all these years later. Like when Phoenix came out with her album uh, Listomania, I knew right away who Franz Liszt was. But in any case, uh, most classical music is written in either German or Italian, um, and the singers on this album, this is Prague Metropolitan Orchestra. Uh, I thought it was really cool that Emika name drops the soprano on the album cover. I don't know if that's standard etiquette in classical music, but I really think it's cool how throughout this album she gives props to all the parties involved. Like, uh, this is the booklet which came with it. Really cool. Um, the first half of it is a full spread of the city of Prague. Prague is a beautiful city, and I think it's great that she made it integral to this album. And then on the back, she just goes through giving credit to all the people involved with the making of this album. And it really looks like it was a labor of love. It was a labor by a team of people who had a unified vision and are all very passionate about what they do, which is always the formula for an absolutely amazing album, uh, which is exactly what this is. Um, this only has six tracks. Uh, the titles are in English instead of Italian or German, like most classical music, if I'm not mistaken. And each one is a uh, emotion. So the tracks on this album, or, or the emotions, or however you want to look at them, uh, they're all very well sequenced. Uh, we start out in the, the pit of grief. It's a very brooding, stagnant piece. And then we go on to some more uh, positive emotions. I would say the epitome of which is the love track. Um, the compositions that Emika does are definitely in line with what you would think of as you read these track titles, like The Miracle, Letting Go, Love, Destiny, Finally Free. But um, the, what you would expect the compositions to sound like is usually the, only the first 30 seconds or so of the arrangement. They go through a lot of different movements, um, some of which are very dark, and you're not sure if the track is going to come out of them. And uh, I guess if it does, in the, for instance, in the case of love, uh, it starts out very airy, but then goes into a more tumultuous period, I guess. And uh, you feel like if it doesn't come out of that, Emika is saying something um, about the hopelessness of love or something like that. Um, and I wouldn't say, even though all these tracks start out the way you would expect and then kind of dive into something darker, they never really go back to the top of the mountain again. They never really get cheery or, or airy or whatever the case may be again. But they do always end with some sense of absol absolution and finality that while it may not be as cheery as where, as where the song started out, is very complex and very complete and it's just very satisfying when you take the tracks and the album as a whole. Um, that was pretty abstract, and but then this is pretty abstract music. Um, and I don't know that much about classical music, so just deal with it. So yeah, the first album on my best of list is a classical album. It was that kind of strange year for music. And let's keep it rolling. Up next, St. Vincent. 